Okay, everybody, and welcome to tonight's panel, Games with Invisible Buttons. We've got three designers whose work straddles digital and non-digital technology and form, discussing the relationships at work with games with invisible buttons. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Freeplay's online festival sponsors, Surprise Attack, and just for a bit more about Freeplay, we're running all week here in Melbourne, Australia. And we've still got tickets to our symposium at Acme on Sunday, April 19th. Visit freeplay.net.au for more info. Also, we'll be taking questions at the end of the panel, so if you tweet on the hashtag, <coughs> uh, we'll be able to see those and pass those on to the panelists. All right, and with that, let's begin. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we were going to start by all explaining a little bit about ourselves and, and what we do and a few of the games we've made. So mm -hmm. I'll just briefly kick that off. My name's Holly Gramazio. I'm a game designer currently based in London. I moved there from Adelaide about eight years ago. And I make stuff that whose physical situation is important to how it works as a game, essentially. So events and installations and located stuff. I used to be lead game designer at a company called Hide and Seek where I worked on projects including um, the New Year Games which was a big street game on the streets of Edinburgh on the 1st of January back in uh, 2012, so long ago now, but where we asked people who were wandering the streets to pick a team out of two teams, uppies and doonies. We had big wicker statues representing a stag and an eagle for the different teams. And then they could play different games all around Edinburgh. Like There was a, a labyrinth with a minotaur in the middle uh, in the cathedral and a, sort of a hopscotch dance course in dance space. And in the big public square where we were situated, there were lots of carnival-style games and silly things like Helter Skelter Bingo, where you went down a big Helter Skelter holding a ball and walked down through a tent of people playing bingo who would cross your ball off. Hmm. And whatever game you played, you won tokens, and you brought the tokens back and put them in buckets under your statue. And at the end of the day, we weighed them up to see who won. <clears throat> I think we had about 10,000 people play in some way during the course of the day. It was yeah. just a really 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 lovely time it's a few years ago now but it's still one of the things that I go to to explain what I do partly because it was an extraordinary experience to get to do and partly because it's relatively easy to explain whereas some of the other stuff in this area it's kind mm. of quite difficult to to get across you almost have to go well come along and play a thing and it'll make sense but since then I've been doing more physically located play um, on my own for the last 18 months or so. So recently I did a project called Hotel Room for a festival called Play Public which was running in Krakow and that's the game where two or three people go into a hotel room and find an immaculate hotel room and they also find a computer on the desk with a, uh, a description of the hotel room, a little interactive story about it and they move through that and find out more about what's happened in the hotel room in the past while a soundscape builds up of like, memories of past people in there and there's just little physical games for them to play in the hotel room with each other and it's kind of about the oddness of being in hotel rooms and the temporariness of that space although the first time we ran it people did assume it was a locked room mystery so I had to sort of hurriedly revise it and make it very clear on the first page that this was not a locked room mystery so that people wouldn't be in there for 20 minutes turning over mattresses and trying to take the mirror off walls. <laughs> and just finally sort of more installation-y stuff so another project I did last year was called Games for Places which was for a festival called East Star and Creates run by former arts and we picked six locations around East Durham, a couple of community centres, a couple of parks, a shopping centre and a big weird sculptural bridge thing and made up site specific games that you could play just with your friends and whatever you happen to have with you for each of those locations, five or six for each location and we stenciled the rules onto walls and the ground and 
decorated them in ways that made it more playable. So in the parks, for example, so since it was autumn, we stenciled 50 red and orange and yellow autumn leaves on the ground all scattered through the park, and we used those in all of the different games. Like, quite easy things about just spotting all of the yellow leaves, more complicated things about um, taking your dog for a walk and getting a point every time it walked over a leaf unless it walked over a red <laughs> leaf. And then big team games of people running around and standing on the leaves and things like that. So yeah, a range of stuff, but mostly around the events and installations kind of end of things and always with some sort of location specificity, I guess. Um, Kate, were you going to explain what you do next? Sure. Um, so I'm Kate Rain Scoldy. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, but I live in Fremantle, Western Australia. Been here for about eight years, and um, been making games for about that um, length of time as well. Um, similar to Holly, I create largely games where uh, place matters, um, but not always. Um, I've worked on a few kind of experimental games that are taking different genres, like board games that have um, some kind of board uh, iPad or another component to them. So I guess what would best describe my work would be experimental and mixed or cross-platform games. Um, I think that's kind of a running theme, is that it's really hard to describe the kind of stuff that we do, but it all kind of, if you play them, you kind of, you kind of know what, you're, what, what we're talking about. But I think it, it does really take playing them and seeing a bunch of games with invisible buttons to really understand what it is that we do. Um, some games that I think have really stood out for me in, in my work, um, which I would say Gentrification, the game, which I think is probably one of um, my most known works, which actually I think we played it, yeah, we did um, Hide and Seek in 2010. And uh, that was basically like a live action Monopoly game where it was, we did it in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn and London and a few other places. And every time we did it, we basically customized it for the street. So we would ba basically make a big chalk map of the place that we were doing it, the city we were doing it in, and you would run around and basically collect buildings. So you're either a, the, the local team trying to save the neighborhood from being gentrified or the developers trying to gentrify the neighborhood. So that was kind of the theme of the, the game. And for me, that game was really changed my work because it accidentally or inadvertently made me realize how conducive or how naturally supportive these sorts of games are for pro-social outcomes. And that, I think, shaped my work because ever since then I've been really focused on um, using the kind of cross or mixed platform games for social change or education. And I think they naturally do that for a variety of reasons. Um, most recently I worked um, on a game called Memory, which was a, a narrative focused escape room that also had digital components in the State Library of Western Australia. And that was really interesting to me because it had the one, on the one hand, the component of working with the library to get new people into the library and, re and experiencing the library's collections in a different way through play, but also because it was kind of like an alternate reality game or a pervasive game in a box. So um, I worked on that with Harry Lee and David Fono, um, who a few people working in this space probably know. Um, and it was really interesting for, the, for those reasons. Um, and I think we really tried to push the boundaries we were we had chatted a lot, especially me and Harry, about how you really have to suspend your disbelief when you play an escape room. It's kind of like, okay, you're trying to solve a mystery and you're in this room and this the solutions to the puzzle or the murder or whatever it, it happens to be are just conveniently puzzle answers to puzzles. So we wanted to actually have a story that you didn't have to suspend your disbelief. And um, we ended up making this crazy narrative about um, a secret government lab in the basement of the Library of Western Australia that was running this project to extract people's memories. And you basically were, the, the escape room was actually the interface to these memories and you were experiencing memories and um, stuff from, the, from Australia, Western Australian history and um, at the end you had to make a decision about what you were going to do. I'm not going to tell you anymore because we might run it again so I'm going to leave out the spoilers. But um, yeah, that's that's basically my work. Cool. So, Christy, over to you. <laughs> oh, quick question: What do you mean by pro-social? Um, so, games that have positive outcomes. So, 
encouraging um, community building or physical wellness or exercise. So things that are um, beyond just uh, having fun. So I think fun is really important, but having a um, fun first and then making games that are also have outcomes that are beyond just fun. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Um, I guess I was, I was looking back um, at when I did my first alternate reality game, and that was yeah t in 2005. Um, and so I worked with a few years with the Australian uh, Film, Television, and Radio School, and we were mentoring um, industry professionals, so film and TV professionals, um, getting them um, into understanding new media. And so we created for these residentials, we created these mini alternate reality games to sort of get them to experience what it's like to go across a whole lot of different platforms and to engage with stories and digital media rather than just sort of describe them with slides. Um, and did that for a few years and, and then um, I found, because it was uh, like yeah, mini ARG where you were just, it was just for a few hours, whereas most, you know, most um, alternate reality games were like weeks and months and all that. Um, and I found, yeah, there's only so much you could do in just a few hours. So the final one, um, we started it uh, two weeks before they before they actually turned up. You know, sent them their email, got them to sort of opt in to to chat with the characters, and then and that that led them through there. It was a, one a funny little thing that happened with that um, final one we did is it designed it so all of the are into these teams. And each of these teams would go off and do these different puzzles. Um, so there were these like different tracks, these different branches, um, and each one of those tracks revealed um, a piece of evidence that would point to a different murderer. Um, so it was like evenly weighted that they would all have, they would all be pointing a finger at someone different rather than the same person to see what would happen when they all got together. Um, <coughs> But what happened, is, and it's something that has happened um, at other times as well, is that one of the actors that was playing one of the characters got so into his role and the improvisation um, that, you know, he was he, like so convincing and, and so charismatic that in the end it, it wasn't evenly weighted at all. They all just, you know, thought that, you know, he was involved or something. Um, and so that's something uh, I've also had recently with another work that I did called um, Bakers of Anarchy, in which uh, and that's, that, that was held at um, Pop Up Playground um, in Melbourne. And with that one, um, I use improv actors again. Um, I love using comedians who know improvisation. Like they're my favourite people to work with on on any sorts of projects. And they were playing uh, some roles, and the players come in. They are um, contestants in a cake decorating championship finale that's been taken over by an anarchist and they have to basically impress the anarchists with their anarchic cake decorations, um, which was super fun to design for anarchy. Um, and yeah, had a similar thing where, where you know, depending on what the actors do, it changes, it changes things that, that actually happen. So. Um, still trying to figure out how to play with that freedom and that looseness and all that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so did those uh, those sort of training ARGs for a while, and then uh, got into doing uh, working on some, I guess, commercial or branded entertainment ones. So I was an experienced designer for a global alternate reality game commissioned by Cisco, and they commissioned it to train their employees and their sales staff in the new technology that they were bringing out. So it was a, a global um, internal training ARG, <laughs> which was pretty pretty intense. And that was with No Mimes Media, you know, Steve Peters and the whole gang. Um, and that was that was pretty crazy. And I was, as, along with being an experienced designer, um, as, as you know, you, you're usually playing characters as well. Um, as from the emails or something like that from behind the scenes. So I was I was playing the Australian, a um, a, a surfer, a, a male surfer in Australia. Um, so it got it got a bit funny when you know some of the 
um, players were sort of flirting with me in that. <laughs> I knew that when I get to the end, I'd realise it was actually a female playing that that male character. Um, but yeah, so I worked on that, and um, I was a, um, a an advisor on Conspiracy for Good, as well as a, another one for ABC, Bluebird AR. But then after that, it was like I, I want to do my own own stuff rather than the you know commission stuff. Like it's it's great to work with those those budgets and 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 everything. But in the end, you know, I wanted to to do something of my own. So so in the last few years, yeah, I've been just doing some installations. Um, I I did an installation here at the Cube at QUT with all of these um, huge huge screens, all these huge touch screens. I had six months to to do this project. Using Connect, so ge uh, gestural um, interface, but mainly sort of touch-based interface. There, it was that same thing of I designed it with the the place being as um, part part of the place of meaning. You know, it wasn't just what what was on the screens, but what was around it that was all you know part of it. Uh, also recently. Um, uh, did a installation for Experimenter, um, which is touring around Australia at the moment, and so that's that's a work which is a game that you can play that's online. But the way you experience it is that it's installed into an old um, an old desk, old school desk, antique school desk that I found um, with all of these scratchings in and everything. And you go in there and you play this escape the room game of like escaping a schoolroom, um, and it's it's sort of Playing with the idea of escape the room games, where where the um, the player is the one that's setting up the problems for themselves. You know, they're the ones that sort of create create the obstacles for them to escape. Um, yeah, and a, a card game uh, that I've made, which I, I guess I, you know I saw it as a pervasive card game in the sense of it's called DIY Spy, and it's a MacGyver game. So basically, you have missions. Um, but we don't supply all the equipment. You have to run around your house and your kitchen to find whatever you can to fulfill the spy missions. Um, and so I always find it interesting that, that over time, that even when I do car games or even when I do you know, a digital game or something like that, I still use the environment around. You know, it's just sort of, it's in the blood. It's like a, a preference for design. So, so yeah, those are some thoughts there. I guess we'll go into like overseeing, looking over patterns in the past. So over to you, Holly. Yeah, I've been thinking about this, about what there is that sort of is a consistent thread through my work. And I don't really have a good answer. I am interested in the physicality of it and making things for site-specific places, but even that, there are a few exceptions, right? There are some things I've made that are purely digital or some things I've made that are like pervasive games or street games but are designed to be playable more or less anywhere. I guess if I think about the games that I found most satisfying to make and that I remember most fondly, they are mostly games where people gather and then do a, a thing together with some sort of jubilation to it. So I think about, you know, the um, Hide and Seek Festival and the stuff we did there. I think about um, the New Year games that I talked about earlier. I think about games like um, Carrier Cards, which I worked on last year with Steve Curran, which is a game to make karaoke less terrifying and you just play it in a karaoke booth and it has suggestions on the cards of types of song like artist begins with B or I hate this person so much or whatever and you just try to combine as many of them as you can to make a song and if you're scared of karaoke which I was when I started working on this it sort of excuses your terribleness by making you go oh it wasn't my fault it was the cards that they meant I, I had to sing Enrique Iglesias I had no choice or if you always sing the same stuff at karaoke and it nudges you to find new things. And I think about that and running a big game of that at Woot in Copenhagen with far more players than the game's meant to accommodate, but just big groups of people shuffling through the decks of cards and coming up with assemblages of 12 cards all at once, not really even within the rules, but it's it's... 
things where there are people that I'm somehow um, forcing to have a nice time, I think is the thing I find most most satisfying. I like getting people to be in a place. I, I like being there while it happens. I don't necessarily like being the person who runs it and explains the rules. I'm very happy to have performers or whatever do that. But I like being there and seeing the people do stuff, which I guess links into why I'm so interested in physicality, right? I'm very shallow and can't be fully satisfied by a thing that I can't see or touch or hear the people having a nice time. I think that kind of um, desire for immediate gratification and physicality and the noise of people having fun is mm. something that's pretty consistent through my work. What about you? Me? Yeah. <laughs> well, we are, either, either of you. Should we yeah. stick to the same order? Okay, so we <laughs> sure. Um, yep. yeah, I, I would say very similar for me um, as well. Um, it's it's a lot of work doing creating these games, but when it comes when you're done and when you actually are watching people play, I think I remember why I do it because it's just it's just great to help people have fun in this way, where almost you're also seeing something different than you would perhaps with a video game because the element of having people together often will create something different than what you intended or um, will perhaps extend it or have a bit of a surprise to it. And I think you can't have that in any other medium and I really enjoy also being there and seeing people have fun and do something a bit different with what I've created. Um, I also really enjoy the encouraging people to be mischievous or subversive. Um, I think that's also connects with my desire of making games that are fun but also have um, outcomes that are beyond fun and I think I'm not a super fan of um, edu edutainment or edu games where it's kind of like the entertainment or the thing beyond fun comes first. I feel like because of the, the platform of these games being in physical space and with other people, you can have the fun first and then the other things just naturally come with it. So if you're making a physical game, often there will be physical exercise that's required in playing that game, or if you're making a game about space activation or a game about community building, those things just happen naturally because of the way that the game is created. And so that's what I think kind of runs through my, my work is that fun and subversion as almost a natural, naturally conducive for things beyond fun. Yep. Christy. Yep. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've noticed because I you know, I, I'm also doing non sort of pervasive gaming works and that as well, more now too. And but I've noticed I'm, I'm still approaching it with the same same sensibility. And so I've been thinking about you know what is it and and there's and so I think for me part of part of the attraction of you know making games in the street or um, alternate reality games and things like that is that. It's sort of the invisible design aspect to it where um, it's not obviously saying, um, like, you're not dealing with all of the obstacles of, of like, I'm going to direct you to, to do this, you know, using this arrow and all that sort of stuff. You're, you're relying, you have to design for um, internally motivated um, actions from the player as much as possible. Like, they have to naturally feel driven to to go over to that area and that's because you know uh, the you know we've placed an actor or a clue or something like that in an area that sort of leads itself to it or we've we've, we've given them some some bit of information or you know some mission beforehand and they're actively looking for it um, and I just I find that process of being internally motivated to run around really interesting and I, I see it more and more in the digital games now. It's really obvious to me when it's not about internal motivation um, um, or if it is. Uh, and so I find it really interesting when it's designed in such a way where you're not noticing the design. You think that you're driving yourself to do things as opposed to the game is telling you to. Um, and that's something that I'm finding as part of 
part of you know my my attraction and uh, appeal to this and applying it to other forms. Just that that I don't know the simplicity of it. It's, yeah, that, does that make sense? <laughs> Either of you. <laughs> Dead silent. <laughs> All right. Okay. If if you want, do you want me to explain further or? Yeah, I'm, I want to hear more. But does, okay, I guess I guess it's a case of um, like there are some um, digital games that, that that I play, for instance, where it's, it's really obvious where it's basically they're trying to lead the player to do something. You know, whether it's just like text up there coming up, or um, you know, or they've created a, a path that you there's only one way you can sort of walk through the path, and so basically you stop thinking. You stop doing things, and the game is telling you what you need to do. Um, and I really like designs where it's about the the player feels as if they're making the decision, the decision rather than the game is making it for them. And I think this is where I got a lot. What's what attracted to me to the pervasive gaming in that is that we we don't have control over the environment that's there. Yeah. You know, we don't. We didn't design the street. You know, we didn't. We didn't design the the tent and all that sort of stuff. So. So we have to use that, um, create a story world, create a rationale around that, what, whatever is existing, and then use what natural triggers players already do. You know, which is like, oh, I'm, I'm, I will go to the, you know, shady looking person or the person with, you know, this or that. Like the the things that they naturally are drawn to, like that's what we're tapping into. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's that's but that's something that I find finding interesting. Because I think also, too, within that, because we don't have a lot of control over, because almost sometimes people are the computer or people are the interface, the players as well, yeah. um, you have to create for a lot more leeway and experimentation and things that are, are unexpected. Like, you can play test it, but you're, there's going to be things that are going to happen that you have to try and account for or, like, leave the room for, and that often creates things that are even more interesting, and I think... Yeah, that's what I love about it too. Yeah, I mean it's the least the least play tested of <laughs> types of game, games. You know, it's just, yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, they're a little bit hard to play test the whole properly beforehand. Mm. I'm sometimes jealous of digital games' ability to stop people from cheating. Like when you've got a digital world, generally speaking, with a few, you know, exceptions for glitches and so on, um, the constraints of what you're permitted to do are the constraints of what you physically can do in that world. If you can do the thing in the world, then it's not cheating. If you take a shortcut in Mario Kart, you're not cheating. That is one of the intended affordances of the game. And we have no way of stopping people from cheating. Um, having to constantly bear in mind that some people will try to cheat is, um, and you know, succeed at it if you're not very, very careful. And like, how do you ameliorate the effects of the inevitable cheating? Is I, that's one of the things I envy digital games people not having to worry about so much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you you, you definitely do get players doing things that wasn't. Um, expected or something like that, but yeah, they're limited by what they can do. Whereas in the real world, you know, <laughs> anyone could do anything. A passerby could do anything. You know, they could they could break out into song. Like there's no limit on their affordances. Where the the constraints is something that they're putting in in their own mind um, as as sort of triggered, at, you know, by us at the beginning, and then you're just like hoping. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's also that element of the innocent bystanders, which I, I love to include in my games if possible, um, which yeah. is to have interaction with people who aren't playing the game um, and, and seeing how much you can get the players to get those those innocent bystanders to do bizarre and interesting things. Yeah. But that adds that other element of um, even more unexpectedness in terms of what could happen and lack of control. Have you had any but problems? I kind of I kinda like that. Encouraging, encouraging mischief. Um, no, not so far. Um, usually people, because I'll, what I'll try and do is build in something that will make, like it's never mean or malicious, it's always a nice interaction. So um, asking people to 
one of my games. Um, I think, yeah, you played, I don't know if you played this this iteration of it, um, Christy, but it was um, Space Trek, the, the new generation, which was um, part of the game is you had to, you had to argue with a, 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 an evil, somewhat evil um, space entity about why, the, why humanity should be saved, and so you had to go around asking innocent bystanders to yeah. argue for, for humanity. So things like that, or giving candy and flowers to, to bystanders as kind of like a PR campaign and gentrification. So it's always a nice thing, it's never a mean thing, and I think yeah. people, people tend to respond well to the nice things happening to them. I remember I, I played a game... Have you guys had, had anything weird happen? I, I played a game once where um, it wasn't it wasn't mine. I, I was uh, going on to to view, to just to experience it, and at the end, uh, we were given these little envelopes with a message in them, and the message was this horrible thing of, um, you know, you might as well like kill yourself or give up or something. <laughs> it was it was horrible, and and we were directed to go and give it to a person on the street. Um, and yeah, we were horrified. <laughs> it was like, what a horrible thing! And these people were like watching us because we were, we were around this, you know, beautiful environment, and they were like excited, excitedly waiting for us to give to give them something. And it was just this horrible, <laughs> this horrible note. It was like, oh, yeah, wouldn't do that. What happened? Um, well, some. Um, I feel bad. I actually did pass it on. <laughs> you know. I, uh, but I was like, I was like, no, like, yeah, and and the people that I was with, they were like, no, nah, I'm not passing it on, which which makes complete sense. Um, yeah, so that that was a weird thing. But I mean, I've I've just had the weird thing of, uh, you know, things happen. So one one alternate reality game, uh, we had a whole lot of police tape, you know, around the scene, and we had the chalk outline of the of the dead body and all that sort of stuff. Um, and all the players were running around doing all of these things, and then suddenly um, all these fire engines turned up, and there were all these these firemen running around, run, running around the place. And I, I just thought, oh, like someone's like created an emergency, thinking that what we've done is is real. Um, yeah, it was a it was a false alarm. But I had this I had this moment of just being terrified that that yeah that I'd, I'd gone too far. Yeah, I um tend to try to avoid um, like getting people to directly interact with bystanders. I, I mean, maybe it's partly based on having mostly done this work in the UK where people are like super, super reluctant to do that. Possibly if I'd started making work somewhere else, I would have ended up differently. But mostly I, I, I do like to make sure there's a path for bystanders to figure out what's happening and if possible to get involved like if there's a if it wasn't a thing where everyone had to gather together at the start and play to make sure that there's a path for them to find a way into playing as well if they want to mm. and um, make sure that they understand that something peculiar is going on like um, you know, if you see a person running after another person mm -hmm. on the street like you're response might be oh my god someone's stolen a bag but if they're both wearing brightly colored ribbons around their arms or yeah. have a hat on or something like yeah. just that visual indication to bystanders that everything's okay and like yeah. the worst reaction that bystanders are going to have that is sort of an eye roll and like, slight irritation right like yeah. being slightly being slightly irritated is I think the worst experience I want any bystanders to have of my games and so for me that's more about making it visible what sort of thing is going on and giving them a pathway to get involved if they want um, rather than having people directly interact with them but obviously you know there are lots of really interesting and lovely games that take a different approach to that. Yeah, yeah so I guess from that we can uh, let's jump off the London thing and, and talk about some of the differences between how we see, you know, pervasive gaming and all that sort of stuff in in, in different countries. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought um, Hotel Room that I mentioned recently, uh, mentioned earlier, having run in Poland, Escape the Room games are massive. They're, like, all over, like, that half of Europe 
uh, super, super popular. There are cities with, you know, 50 Escape the Room games in them. So in that context, like the people that I had tested the game on a little bit in the UK and got them to play it through, even though they weren't necessarily in a hotel room, the stuff they imagined was going on was very, very different to what the stuff people in Poland imagined was going on, because as soon as you put people in a room there with some sort of game framework, you have to try really, really hard, or they will just automatically assume that they are looking for a clue in a book that leads them to open the locked fridge and so on. Mm. So there's just strange, like different assumptions in how things work and what to expect from a game and what to expect from a public participatory artwork that lead to very different outcomes in how people approach them sometimes, I think. Mm -hmm. I've had I've had the odd situation of um, making these games, but always living in a city where it's not really a thing. So in Toronto, um, there's a huge indie video game scene, but you know it didn't doesn't really connect with the kind of stuff I do. Um, in Perth, there's one other group here that um, that does similar games, but they couch their stuff more as I guess um, uh. live art. Yeah, our, PVI. yeah. So this PVI collective. So their yeah. yeah, and their stuff is really similar to mine in that they're very much about mischief and subversion. So I'm a big fan of their work, but it's it's tough being in a place where there isn't a big scene of people doing things. Um, and I think how that's affected what I do is that I do a lot of collaborations with um, people um, not from where <coughs> I'm living. And the other yeah. thing too is what I'm trying to describe. I maybe. I feel like this is still a thing globally, but you know we talked about it earlier. Trying to describe what you do, um, people automatically assume I make video games, and I think in Western Australia there's still a lot of prejudice about against video games being this kind of thing where you're some kind of horrible person who likes violent video games, and they're just a huge waste of time. And so there's kind of all of the this baggage that comes with talking about games and play. Um, so I've never, I mean, I've worked on. One of the first games I did was actually a a pervasive game. I think it's the only pervasive. No, the, no, PBI did a bunch of stuff after, but it was the first I think in in Perth called Ghost Town, and there was a lot of interest from the government at the time, which was odd, but um, still not a lot of um, people really. I think it was too soon, and I think we're starting to get we have that more of that public culture and being in in public space and engaging with stuff in, 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 in that with art and festivals and things. I think it might be a better time now, but it's still still not still not Europe. I love all the stuff that happens in Europe. Yeah. I mean even <clears throat> there are a lot of like small physical games festivals in Europe, but even so it's like you can't expect any person that you come across to have, even any person in games, to necessarily have much of an idea of this as a field. I, yeah. I still get people going, is that, is that, is that your job? <laughs> you know, <laughs> assuming, that, or even, is that a job? Yeah. Um, seems to be, like, seven, eight years on, still seems to be, but, yeah, there is, a, there is more activity and that's really great and it means that there's sort of more ability to play other people's stuff and talk about how things are going and have that sort of make a game and try it out at a festival that's coming up and all of that kind of thing. It's really great, but it doesn't necessarily mean that passers-by or um, people that you talk to will have any more idea of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, things have changed a lot here since Pop-Up Playground, you know, have been has been running um, and you know of course they've been bringing people over but you know every every year you know twice a year and more you know actually putting on all of these these live street games uh, and they've got their regular visitors you know regular attendees and people that they sort of drag in for someone's walking by and they go oh that looks interesting and they, they, they jump into it um, but yeah you still have to have to tell you know explain to people what it is um, but yeah, it has it has changed a lot. Um, it's not as as weird, and I, I find it particularly interesting juxtaposing this with the emergence of local co-op in in digital you know gaming, 
where basically you know making digital games for people to play with each other live socially you know so you both have to be there in the same room um, to, to play these games um, and so even though it's still on a console or it's on your tablet or it's on the desktop computer um, yeah, you basically have to have people sitting around with you, and you know they're designing them. The best ones, you know, are basically designed to have that that take into account what it's like, that proximity, and mm -hmm. what you know things that they will say to each other and things that they will do to each other and, and everything. So I find that really fascinating that that's that's emerged you know over the last few years, and and so now I I find a lot of um, digital gamers sort of go, oh right. <laughs> I like that sort of thing, mm. um, but I guess it, it it had to be it had to be you know rooted to you know to a digital device I guess yeah, something familiar for, for them to see it yeah yeah mm. there's a really interesting group here called um, SK Games and they do that exact thing but almost pushed to another um, closer to kind of the games that we do where they will. Um, make games that are meant to be played specifically in social spaces and they have really odd interfaces to them. So the last game they made was called Catnips, which yeah. is basically a game of... Um, <laughs> they, they rigged Xbox controllers to be cat nipples, so the, the interface is like two cats with, with three Xbox controllers in each, so you have eight nipples, and you're controlling these cats, digital cats on the screen with these, you know, very analog cats, puffy cats, and you're, you're trying to feed your kittens. <coughs> and um, it's, it's very much kind of designed to be potentially played by six people per cat or three people per cat, <laughs> and it's very much a physical, so it's almost like the other end of, of what we do, which is a very physically rooted, socially rooted game. Mm. Um, and people seem to get that, but they have the same problem and where they have trouble describing to people what's different about their games than, than the regular video games. Yeah. But I think... I enjoy having them around because I think them and they're pretty, they're closer and kind of to my, or to what we do in terms of the philosophy behind it. They kind of get it. We, we get each other's work. Yeah, and that's what I like is the input device is part of the meaning making. Um, you know, whereas in a, mm. a lot of digital games, you know, it's like the, the your controller or your um, your tablet or your key your keypad, you know, is your keyboard. Um, it's like you know, ignore that. Like that's just how you input. That's not actually part of part of the the experience yeah. at all. It's all um, you know behind the screen. Whereas for you know, with alternate um, with alternate reality games, you know, the, being at your computer was part of the story world. You know, it was it would actually made the input device actually part of the fictional mm. world as well. And that's. It's yeah. It's about sort of extending the design to every little every little part that you touch. This sort of starts to nudge into the question of how on earth does this all get paid for, doesn't it? Which a couple of people have asked on Twitter as well. Yeah. Which, which yeah, in my case at least, is definitely on a quite sort of ad hoc basis. Like different projects get paid for in different ways. Sometimes it run an event and sell tickets for it. Sometimes you just try to make a thing because you think it would be neat. Um, at the moment I'm doing a few different projects and like one of them is a thing for an arts festival, one of them is some consultancy that I assume I'm not allowed to talk about and one of them is curating an event for a museum. So it's a sort of balancing act of finding different sources of funding or of projects to get involved in or of places to do things for that are interested in this kind of thing mm. and um, just piecing a body of work together from that I guess. Yeah. Kate, what's your... Yeah, I know it's very similar. Um, I actually started out just doing this making games just for fun because it was it was a hobby and I just loved it. Um, that, you know, bringing people together and encouraging them to make mischief. Um, and so I did it for maybe six or seven years, um, just as a, as a hobby, not ever trying to make money out of it. Um, but then I started getting people interested in especially the, the um, community building or the educational aspect of it. And it started to become something that I actually did as, as a job. 
which I think maybe I was also reluctant to do because I was worried that it would it would compromise my ability to to do things I was interested in and um, things that kind of <coughs> were in line with my my values and my philosophy. But I've been very lucky in that I haven't that hasn't been a problem. Um, so yeah, I mean it's just kind of been largely either grants or um, Nonprofits who want something done and they're they're getting funding from somewhere and it is kind of just piecing it together and it is is a challenge especially because um, every time we make something we need to make a new platform to to launch it or to run it or to create it so if you're a video game developer you have Unity but we have to make Unity and make the game every time we make a game and so I think that makes it even more challenging because you can get funding to do that but it's you're never going to be you're never going to make become rich making these kind of games as it stands right now and I don't I mean I guess it depends what you're in it for but it you know it's it can be challenging sometimes in terms of the amount of work and stress and stuff that goes into it but yeah I guess it depends what you're you're in it for but that's the kind of challenge yeah there's we don't really have a pay to play a strong pay to play model um so, so rather than getting money from our users, you know, from our players, uh, although things like local co-op and escape the room games, you know, like that's, that's going crazy uh, and that's related to us. So there, there's people who are willing to pay, you know, yeah. as long as it's a, a, a pa easily packaged, yeah. you know, repeatable, repeatable experience. You know? It's like the escape the room is almost like a platform to build on like a Unity platform and that's repeatable. Yeah. So that works, I think, for that model. Yeah, and uh, it's, I mean, for me, yeah, it's been commissions um, and branded entertainment, so, you know, being a subcontractor for branded entertainment stuff. Um, and I see, it, I see it like the path of, uh, like traditionally the path of film directors was that, you know, they'd do a few TV commercials and they would learn a lot of their skills that way or, you know, music videos and that and then they'd go on to do films. Like that, that sort of used to be part of the path. So I sort of, I sort of see the early brand and entertainment days of ARGs as like a similar sort of thing <laughs> where we got to use other people's budgets to like sort of learn some of the things and then we go off and we do our own art stuff. I am really interested in the potential of making a thing that we just sell to the people who want to play it, which we tried a couple of times, variants of that at Hide and Seek. We did an app about sort of little location specific games and things like that. I love it. I love um, tiny games. Yeah, that, that uh, was, was good fun to work on. Great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, digitally mediated physical play is a, an interesting thing, right? And I don't think anyone's quite figured out a way to use it yet to distribute the kinds of work that we make but in a way where you directly sell stuff to the people who want to play it but it seems like someone's going to do it at some point right and just the benefits of being able to make a thing that people can then play on the other side of the world if they want to without you having to physically go there and like get someone to put a little bit, put a staging in there so you can stand on the staging and then yell at them to explain the rules or whatever. Made a couple of tiny, tiny digital things last year just when I had two or three spare days, a little game about blackbirds, a little game about pornography. And the, the fact that after I'd made it, people could immediately play it was astonishing. It was just confusing and peculiar and... Um, intoxicating in a way. Like, oh my god, people are playing this thing that I haven't had to schedule a time yeah. at a theatre. I haven't had to do any of that. I'm really yeah. excited by the possibilities around this. I do want, like, one of the big things I want to have done in the next two to three years is to have made an attempt at a thing that is just a thing that if what people want to play at, they give me a small amount of money and then they play it and it goes to them through the wonder of the internet and I don't have to go there and I don't have to cut ribbons up for them or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things I think, I mean, you can do that with digital games, obviously. Mm. Hello, birds. Um, but one of the things I've been <laughs> wanting to do for years is um, this idea of like an ARG in a box, but 
uh, when we get to the point where it's possible, I, I'm looking forward to it. But basically, it, it triggers all the um, technology in your house. So it's, it's like how, how to host a murder, except instead of taking over all of your devices, you know, it's like your TV turns on and there's, you know, a video that, that's playing and then suddenly your toaster is going and there's, you know, there's a clue in there and radio up in the bedroom is on. So you all, you all go up there and find out what's going on, like completely activate the house. You know, we, we will be able to, to do that at some point, um, but we're going to have problems with proprietary, proprietary <laughs> you know. <laughs> There was a, a really interesting thing I saw at GDC this year, which was um, Google's new Tango device, which um, basically they are able to map the physical room that you're in, and the device learns all about that room. And so I was started to started to think it's it's still really early right now, um, but started to think about the possibilities of actually creating something that is you get this device and you 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 basically create the game and then this device maps your room and then takes the game that you've created and puts it into someone else's room. So it's site specific but to you. So that kind of got me pretty excited. But um, I think it's going to be a while before that technology um, becomes really accessible and for most people to, to buy. But I think they're actually trying to build it into their new Google phones in a few years. So it might actually be, you know, we had that revolution with, with um, the iPhone making it a lot a lot easier for us to do games that have GPS or have um, you have to take photos or any of those things that the iPhone just has in your pocket. So if this becomes a thing that you can just have in your pocket, then it becomes a lot more viable both creatively and economically. Yep. I'm just um, having a quick look at the Twitter. So we've got Harry Lee and Chad chatting away, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> Hello. Do you have any uh, other questions? Yeah, if you guys want to ask questions, I think we have like five minutes left, so just ask to um, free play 15. Yeah. Are we going to, I guess, um, the, I don't know. We'll keep talking until someone asks <laughs> more questions. <laughs> That's right. Oh my gosh, Harry Lee has said that this is our chance to decide what we call this fear forever. Oh my god, I don't think it is. People have made this decision so many times and That's it never <laughs> Um, I tend to just go for physical at the moment because it's maybe the least confusing and also the one that um, most comfortably encompasses more a greater proportion of the things I do. But yeah, yeah. or the world where the games with the world as the game board. Mm. Although there's not one nice word to sum it up. Yeah. You need at least a sentence. Yeah. Physical <laughs> games is pretty good. It, it, um, with yeah. all terms, it just depends on the context, you know, who's, who's yeah. listening. Yeah, it depends and, who you're talking to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I guess maybe we should, we've done, we've done a little bit of looking forward, but, um, you know, what's our, our, our amazing summary thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> No pressure. Well, I mean, but besides, besides, like the long, long looking forward that I just mentioned, like what, what are you both doing, um, in the, you know, over the next year or so, or even current projects? So Holly. Oh gosh, I mean, I've got some. Uh, sorry, I hadn't um, really thought this through. I've got this big hectic spreadsheet of what I'm doing exactly when with different bits of colours shaded differently urgent um, shades of red for how panicked I have to be at particular times about getting things done but yeah I guess the biggest the things I'm in the early stages of at the moment are curating a night at a museum in July and trying to figure out what other sort of curatorial stuff I want to do. I kind of miss having regular events, so figuring out whether I want to do that kind of thing again and how that would work. And also um, a couple of games for arts festival style things, but that still at the stage where my description of the project is two paragraphs long. They're not yet at the stage where I can um, get it down into a sentence that makes sense to people. It's all things like, so you go here and do this, and then this is printed as a thing, and this is 
you know, in a couple of weeks that makes sense, but at the moment it's lots of uh, tangled threads. Yep. Kate? Um, I'm wrapping up a game called uh, Gallera the Game right now. I think that's the working title. But it's basically an augmented card game. So it's I'm um, working with Wariana Street Media, which is an Aboriginal run organization up in Roburn in um, northern Western Australia. And it's um, basically a game that they commissioned for me to work on with them to help uh, the community, especially kids in the community, learn more about their culture. So specifically about, um, um, it's called the skin system. So um, how, what, what to call your family members so you can and can't marry, what you can hunt and what you can gather. Um, and it's a, an augmented card game in that there is a sort of collectible physical card game component, but those are going to have QR codes <coughs> on them that will connect to a website that will allow more further exploration of all of these different things. Um, so I'm wrapping up that hopefully in the next few weeks. And a um, few different things in the iron, in the fires in the iron right now. Iron, fires in the iron, irons in the fire <laughs> um, right now. Um, but I guess they're all really early, but the most kind of concrete early thing is a game for a, um, as it's going to be embedded as part of a large um, day-long event that happens here. Um, I've done games for events in the past and they've been a challenge, but I think this could be really interesting to have like a, be actually embedded in, in the event itself where it's not just something that's just kind of stuck on like an app, but actually is what is part of what happens during the day. And I can't really say more than that, but um, yeah. I'm hoping that that will work out. It's pending funding right now, but I think it could be really interesting. Cool. Um, I guess you have to Thank you. Uh, similar to you, uh, I've been commissioned to create a um, a physical game uh, for a regional community uh, out in in um, North North Queensland, and it's part of a um, sort of disaster recovery sort of initiative. So so towns that have had a horrible time, for instance, with floods or cyclones, they bring artists in to work with them and create something. So they've brought me in to make a game with the town, uh, this regional town. Um, and so basically, in, inspired by Tiny Games, um, I'm putting putting together a, because um, they also want me to archive a whole lot of stories of the town. Um, and I've been collecting stories, but then I thought, what would be really interesting is to archive their play over the generations. So I'm working with all the school kids there, and we're <coughs> basically sort of interviewing, you know, everyone and finding out all, all the different ways that people used to play, you know, in the streets and in the schools and in the homes and in the paddocks and that um, over the generations um, and putting all of that into into the app um, and, yeah, sort of designing that. So um, that'll be launched at the end of the year, so working on that at the moment. That's, that's a lot of fun. Um, and another... The other one for myself um, is a digital game, and it's I'm just in early development at the moment. I'm going to take my time with it, uh, so I can you know take my time to sort of develop it well. Um, and so that one's a um, like a, a buddy adventure um, between a um, blind spider and its guide fly. Um, so oh, that yeah. sounds so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they're the two 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 main ones. Yeah. With smack on eight o'clock. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, yeah. I was just I was just quickly looking to see if there were any questions, but I don't but I don't think there are. Yeah, I think just the thing I'd briefly like to say is um, coming off of that thing you were saying, Christy, about archiving stories, which sounds like an amazing project. I I guess this is something we've all found, that people sometimes respond to this kind of stuff with a little bit of suspicion or a little bit of confusion. And then if you start talking to them and say things like, what games did you play when you were a kid? Like that ability yeah. for them to tell a story and like explain a game to you and remember why playing in physical space is interesting is just an amazing way of engaging them and, and, get, and letting them win themselves over to the yes. idea. Once, 
this isn't to say that this sort of game is all about acting like children again and so on, which is something that I get sometimes, even in like positive talking about it, people going, oh, it's so great to act like you get again. I don't, no, adults play, adults have always played. There's this weird yeah. anomaly in like 1950 to 2000 where we don't think of adults as playing and thank God that's going away again. Yeah. But just that people's moments of what they got from physical play in the past and their attempt to share that with you lets them win themselves over to the idea of it and it's a really really nice thing seeing that happen. Yeah it was um, and that's exactly what, what what did happen you know there was sort of the what I'm not sure about this <laughs> and then it's, you know, it's, as soon as I mentioned how about we archive your play and they were like the, you know, all the critical facilities were are out the window. I was like, of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, where do we start? <laughs> you know, um, and and it was, but it was also it was also a way to bridge the physicality that was required of the players um, with what we were archiving. You know, because they just started archiving the stories, and it was like, if I'm just telling stories, it doesn't relate, phys you know, to the physicality of them needing to be moving around the streets. So I needed a connection between what was happening in the past and what's in the present that was sort of mm -hmm. seamless, and that that seemed to be, you know, something that that bound them together. Mm. I think that's why you see that metaphor kind of used a lot, um, like talking about recess or sand pits or things that are kind of reminding us of um, where we came from and trying to encourage adults to be like kids again, but in a an adult way. So they're not, yeah. as you were saying, Holly, they're not. It's not being a kid again, but you have to kind of remember that um, that feeling or that that sensibility before you can kind of re-engage as an adult. Yep. yep. Well, our lives are better for it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it's where we officially say goodbye. Yeah, it's been really lovely talking to you both. It's been great talking to you. Yeah. To you both as well. We'll do this again. Come yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks a lot to Free Play. Yeah, for thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having us. <laughs> and an all women panel about games. How how <laughs> awesome is that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I guess um um I guess we just hang up. <laughs> this is like an even more <laughs> awkward version of how do you normally end a cycle. This is amazing. How yeah. have we countdown? And then the whole world is watching how we're gonna end it.